Okay, well that's facilitated diffusion. Now let's take a look at our last major mechanism of transport across membranes. And that is active transport. Active transport, like facilitated diffusion, requires specific transport proteins to do this. So we could say it's protein mediated, it requires proteins to do this. Second thing, active transport is unique because active transport allows you to transport molecules from low concentration to high concentration. And that's no other transport mechanism can do that. Now, because moving things from low to high concentration is an endergonic process, active transport mechanisms have to use some form of energy to do the transport. There's a number of ways of doing that, and we'll see that later. Now, one thing with active transport, you may want a situation, like for instance, cells have very low calcium levels compared to the outside world. So how do they keep it that way? They actively transport the calcium ions out of the cell. Cells are going to want to stop out things. If you're in an environment where there are dilute concentrations of nutrients, you can use active transport to take them into you and stockpile them so you can metabolize them later. So active transport, of course, is a very useful type of thing. Now, active transport proteins, once again, these are proteins or complexes of proteins that go completely through the membrane and form some type of channel-like structure allowing things to go through. But there's a couple little differences. We'll see a couple examples in a little bit. Okay, second thing, active transport proteins like facilitated diffusion are regulated. You want to turn active transport on when you need it and turn it off when you don't. So methods of regulation for the most part Some of them can be regulated by the binding of some kind of molecule. So we could say ligand regulated or gated. So some kind of molecule, it could be a protein, it could be a small molecule. Some kind of molecule binds to the active transport protein and switches it on or switches it off. Another common thing is just good old garden variety phosphorylation. As far as I recall, there are no voltage-gated active transport systems. We do have that with facilitated diffusion, but we do have phosphorylation and binding of regulatory molecules. So once again, you have to regulate these things. You don't want them to, especially since they use energy, you don't want them to turn on when you don't need it. All that is, the minimum, is just a huge waste of energy if you use better somewhere else. So we've got that. Now, we do have a little bit of structural information on how some of these active transport proteins work, specifically some of the ones that use ATP hydrolysis as energy source. So I just want to show that, kind of draw that on the board here. Okay, here's a cell membrane. Let's suppose low concentration of something here, high concentration here. Here's our active transport protein. Okay, now some kind of molecule, we'll just call it X, can fit. You notice this channel is open on the outside right now, the area of low concentration, but the protein has a channel closed at the other side. At this point, let's suppose we have bound ATP here. Now, what can happen, this may not be a universal mechanism, but it does seem to be the case at the molecular level for at least a few of these active transport systems. Okay, so now the molecule can go into this channel, but it's closed at the bottom. Now what we do is we hydrolyze the ATP. So let's do that. We're going to have ADP and throw out the phosphate. Now, when you do that, the channel protein changes its tertiary structure. And it changes in such a way 
that it kind of flips around a little bit. And now what happens is the bottom part of the channel is open and the top part is closed. So now this molecule cannot go back outside because it's blocked. The only place it can go is inside. But to be able to cause that protein structure to change back and forth like that requires some form of energy. In this example, it was ATP hydrolysis that provided that energy. But that's not the only way we can do that. So let's take a look at how, well, how we can use energy to do active transport. All active transport requires certain types, requires energy in one way or another. So let's take a look. Energy usage. Probably the most common method to provide energy for active transport is the old brute force method. You grab an ATP, hydrolyze the ATP, use that energy to do the transport. So most, but not all, active transport mechanisms use ATP hydrolysis as an energy source. But there are some active transport mechanisms that don't need to use ATP hydrolysis. Instead, they're going to form a different kind, they're going to do a different kind of coupled reaction. Once again, a coupled reaction is where you have an N extragonic process, an energy releasing process, occurring simultaneously with an endergonic process, which is what you really want to do in the first place. So use the energy from the extragonic process to power the endergonic process. And we use that as an example of ATP hydrolysis. ATP hydrolysis is extragonic. The enzyme captures that energy and uses it to do something endergonic, which is what you're really out to do in the first place. And these methods are what are called co-transport. Now, co-transport, it seems you're doing something along with something else. And what co-transport is like is this. And let me change this diagram out for all this a little bit later. Okay. Put a protein here. All right, that's for future use. Okay, co-transport is this. Co-transport allows the transport of two molecules simultaneously. One molecule is going to go from high to low concentration. That's exergonic. It releases energy. In other words, if you go from high to low concentration, that's facilitated diffusion. So we'll say facilitated diffusion which goes high to low concentration facilitate diffusion and exergonic process of one molecule. That provides the energy to perform active transport, in other words, from low to high concentration, endergonic, of another molecule. Now, they have to be different molecules, by the way. So, let's suppose we have this. I'm gonna, here's a cell, here's a co-transport system. Let's suppose we have a what we really want to do is we want to take molecule A, which I put in a low, small, low, a small side letter here, and move it into the cell and from low to high concentration. Okay, that's what we want to do, but that takes energy. 
Now what we could do is, let's suppose we have molecule B, whatever that is, at high concentration here, low concentration there. We could allow facilitate diffusion of that. You're going from high to low concentration. That provides energy that can simultaneously power the active transport of A. So B, facilitate diffusion from high to low concentration. Powering A, active transport from low to high concentration. Now in this particular example, we have one molecule, A, that's what we want, going into the cell, and B, going out of the cell. It does not have to be that way. As long as one molecule goes from high to low concentration, and the other goes from low to high concentration, it could be like this. We could do, we add a lot of B out here, and relatively little here, we could do facilitate diffusion. In this case, both molecules are going into the cell. B by facilitate diffusion, powering the active transport of A. What matters is the concentration difference. You got to take have something from high to low concentration to provide the energy to go from low to high concentration. So that's co-transport. In fact, there are a number of common co-transports. The advantage of this, if you don't mind the facilitated diffusion of whatever you're using, the advantage of this, of course, is you don't have to waste ATP in doing this kind of transport. Okay, so examples. One of the most common kinds of co-transport systems, and they're found in all different parts of all kinds of different cells, are what we call the sodium The sodium ion, hydrogen ion co-transport systems. You find them in organelle membranes, you find them in the cell's outer plasma membrane. What they do is cells inside have low levels of sodium compared to the outside. So you allow sodium ions to go into the cell, that's facilitated diffusion, and it powers the active transport of hydrogen ions, H plus, out of the cell. And of course, if you're doing that, the, when you're pumping H plus out, it means the pH is going to rise. Or if you do something like that and pump H plus into something, it means the pH is going to drop. You find these in all kinds of different processes. The interesting thing is during the process of fertilization, when sperm meets A, at least the right sperm meeting the right A, one thing that gets activated is this sodium-hydrogen co-transport system. What happens? The cell allows sodium, and with a, a matter of not too many seconds after fertilization, sodium ions rush into the cell, and simultaneously H plus get pumped out of the cell. So the inside of the cell undergoes a pH raise from about maybe 7.2 to about 7.6. That activates a whole bunch of proteins that are involved in starting the process of embryonic development. Recall we said that there are some proteins that are pH regulated. So these proteins are inactive at neutral pH, but in slightly basic pH they switch on. And what does that is this co-transport system. Okay, so that's a second way of using energy to perform active transport. A third way A third way is using the energy of oxidation reduction reactions. Oxidation recalls when you take electrons from something, and reduction is when you pass electrons to something. Now, for the most part, oxidation processes are exergonic. They release energy. So if you oxidize something, the energy release can be used to perform active transport. Good examples of this include what are called the electron transport gene enzymes.
And you find electron transport chains is a critical part of our ATP producing metabolism in the mitochondria. They sometimes call it the respiratory chain because ultimately those electrons get passed to oxygen. You also find similar electron transport chains in chloroplasts, a critical part of photosynthesis. In all cases, they're passing electrons from one molecule to the next, from one protein to the next. That energy release, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, <coughs> that energy release of these oxidation reactions will then be used to power active transport of H plus ions. As we'll see when we talk about metabolism, that act of transport is ultimately going to produce the energy to allow ATP production. So, act of transport is essential for the vast majority of our ATP production. In this case, we're using the energy of oxidation reduction reactions to power that act of transport. So those are three ways of using energy. Now let's take a look at one more aspect. Let's take a look at one more aspect of active transport. Some examples. Because we have a number of these things. Okay, first one. We've mentioned before that cells keep calcium ions at very low concentrations inside their cytoplasm. Cellular concentrations of calcium ions tend to be about a tenth of a micromolar to about one micromolar. Body fluids, fresh water, salt water, you're talking millimolar concentrations of calcium. So, what does that mean? It means that the cell has a thousand-fold, even ten thousand-fold less calcium ions inside than you find in the outside. The only way to do that is to do active transport of calcium ions. And sure enough, we have a whole pile of calcium ion active transport systems. They're called calcium ion ATPases because these guys burn ATP to do the active transport. Okay. That's one common example. Another example here again of ATP using active transport are going to be ones that do active transport of H plus ions. Now we already mentioned the sodium hydrogen ion co-transport system. That's one way of actively transporting H plus ions around. But there are ones that do this by using ATP hydrolysis. And we call these guys the H plus ATP aces often called proton pumps. Okay, how these guys work. You find them all over the place. Certain organelles, membrane-bound compartments in the cells, lysosomes would be a good example, have a very low internal pH because these ATPases have actively transported H plus into them. So the pH in some of these organelles is about five and a half. That's almost a hundredfold difference in concentration compared to the cytoplasm. The reason they do that is the enzymes inside are inactivated by low pH. If you raise the pH, the enzymes turn on, they will literally chew their way out of the walls of the lysosome, get in the cytoplasm, and eat the cell alive from the inside out. Sounds like a great thing, right? Okay, all right. Another place you find it. What's in your stomach? Now think of this. You got a little sick to the stomach and... Okay. And it goes up your esophagus, through your nose, out your mouth. You feel terrible and you feel that burning sensation in your esophagus and that burning sensation in your nose as you double over the toilet bowl. How come? Because your stomach is full of acid. It's got a pH of about one and a half. It's quite acidic. If you have chronic heartburn, acid reflux disease, what do they do? They give you drugs that inhibit these ATPases. They're often called proton pump inhibitors. Think of Zantec. Think of Prilosec. Think of Nexium, the purple pill. I'll tell you. 
Oh, I saw those ads. I take a bottle of citrus in the morning. I, well, I, I'm here a little aside here. When they first start advertising, Nexium is basically a time release version of Prilosec. Prilosec is available as a generic now, which means a lot cheaper. So the drug companies want to make lots of money. They modify a little bit, make a time release version, and then they advertise it heavily. So, you know, I'm seeing these ads all over these websites of several years ago when it first came out. I say, like, oh, the purple pill is here, the purple pill is here. They wouldn't tell you what the heck it was for. You have to actually connect to the hot link to see what's for. And I'm thinking, my God, the last time I saw purple pills, possession of them can get you a year in the joint. It was a first degree <laughs> misdemeanor back in my days. So, I'm oh, man, I'm too old to do purple pills anymore, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I saw lots of purple pills. I didn't hang any myself, but you know, it's like my, my friends did. Yeah, it's like, okay, yeah, this is a first degree misdemeanor. So, yeah. Uh, heavy marketing, but basically time release version of products. But all of those drugs, and here again, this is another example of pharmacology. How many people are thinking going into pharmacy school? Okay. What do these drugs do? They work by inhibiting a protein. They all, by different mechanisms, binding to different parts of these things, they inhibit these H plus ATPases. That means you don't produce as much acid in your stomach, so when the stuff leaks through the valves and up your esophagus, it doesn't burn as bad. That's how these things work. So those are two examples. But there is a third example that is also extremely important. Active transport system. I'm just going to put this guy right over here. What we call these things are the sodium potassium ATPases, often called sodium potassium pumps, or sometimes people just cheat alone, call them sodium pumps, although potassium plays a role here too. Okay, so sodium potassium ATPases. Each cell from bacteria on have tens of thousands of these molecules in their cell membrane. Because all cells have inside low sodium ions and high potassium ions relative to the outside. Okay, low potassium outside, high inside, high sodium outside, low inside. It's about a tenfold concentration difference in each case. Now how, and that's universal with all cells from bacteria to us. Now how does it get that way? Our sodium potassium pump. The sodium potassium pump takes three sodium ions and pumps them out. So we take three sodium ions, pumps them out to high concentration. At the same time, we're going to take two potassium ions and pump them in. So, okay, both ions, so we're moving five ions from low to con high concentration. Three sodium go out, two potassium go in. And folks, have we got a deal for you? Yes, you can pump five ions against a concentration gradient, and we will charge you only one, yes, one ATP to do it. And you call up in the next 30 minutes, we'll throw in an extra ATP. <laughs> okay. So in other words, we hydrolyze one ATP that's actually able to move five separate ions from low to high concentration. Now, the interesting thing, this low sodium, high potassium must be very, very important. And the reason, whatever it is, because it's universal. Bacteria cells have the same thing that we have. Low sodium inside, high potassium inside. Okay, now, there's another thing. So that means many cells will use 10 20, in some cases, even 30% of their total ATP budget just powering these guys. Every cell has tens of thousands of them in their cell membranes. So when they're actively working, they're burning lots and lots of ATP. 
So this must be important if you're going to spend that much of your energy budget on just pumping sodium out and potassium in. But it's universal in all cells. And as we'll see, the sodium-potassium pump is extremely important in certain physiological processes. We'll see that fairly shortly. Okay, now, one other thing I'd like to mention. Notice this. When we run this sodium-potassium pump, we kick out three positively charged ions, the sodium ions. Yet we're only taking two positively charged ions back in. So every time we run that sodium-potassium pump, we're going to have a net loss of one positively charged ion. So when you run it more and more and more and more, what's going to happen? You're going to lose positive charge. So the inside of the membrane is electrically negative compared to the outside. Because you keep on pumping, having a net loss of positive ions. You're pumping positive ions out of the cell. You're depleting the cell of positive ions. So we often call this. So this pump, when you run it, automatically generates that voltage across the membrane that we talked about before. So we often call pumps like this, we call them electrogenic, literally generating an electric potential across the membrane. And here again, all cells have that. It tends to be about 50 millivolts, 60, and sometimes 70, in some cases negative compared to the outside. That doesn't sound like much, but once again, when you're dealing with that little electrical difference across a very thin cell membrane, the electric field is extremely powerful, enough to distort proteins and things like that. But that's a universal thing that we see with life here. Okay. Well, what we're going to do in just a moment or two. Ooh, it's a long one.